Okay, so hello everybody and thank you for joining us. I am Markus Pleyer, the president of the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF, which is the global watchdog on money laundering and terrorism financing. The FATF researches how money is laundered and terrorism is funded. We set global standards uh, to mitigate those risks and we assess the effectiveness of actions that countries take. Here today, we want to present you this report on trade-based money laundering. I would like to thank the Egmont Group of Financial Intelligence Units, FIUs, who co-authored this report with us. In particular, Henny Verbeck kusters who chair the chair of the Egmont Group, who is with us today. Thank you also to Kevin New from the United Kingdom, one of the co-leads driving this project and who works for the UK Customs and Chen Tsai from the German FIU, who also led the work on the project for the Egmont Group. I want to highlight some of the key elements of the report. As we all know, money laundering goes hand in hand with organized crime. It allows criminals to make illicit cash appear legitimate. So money from truck trafficking or people trafficking, for example, can be laundered into the global financial system. Historically, there have been three main ways of doing it. One is to transfer dirty money through banks or other financial institutions. The second one is to move illicit funds physically via cash couriers. And the third one is to use international trade to move and disguise the proceeds of crime. And this is what it is about today, the third one, trade-based money laundering or TBML for short. Trade-based money laundering exploits the international trade system. It allows criminals to disguise their illicit proceeds alongside legitimate international trade and move it between countries. This makes it extremely hard for authorities to detect. I want to give you an example scenario. Footsteps are highly perishable goods. They are ripe for multiple invoicing. Say a professional money laundering network uses food import export companies to clean a drug cartel's dirty money. There are very various methods, but for example, the money launderers could ship fewer goods than stated in a contract. They could price the goods above the market value. They could even not send the goods at all, but supply invoices. And of these methods, uh, any of these methods would allow them to launder money. For example, in the case of overpaying massively for a product, they could have falsified invoices. This can make it appear like a proper and fair business transaction, even though it is not. That is a simple outline of how it can work, but it can be much more complex. For example, by using third party bank accounts and shell companies. It is clear professional money launderers use international trade to disguise dirty money. This helps fuel serious crime and terrorism. It facilitates corruption and hampers competition. A concrete example reference in our report suggests that one criminal network, just one, uh, using TBML and other techniques was able to move 400 million US dollars over several years. It gives you an idea of the scale of the issue. Today's report builds on earlier work and outline ways to identify and tackle trade-based money laundering. This includes the use of better and closer public-private sector partnerships, detailed money laundering risk assessments, and the use of advanced IT systems to detect suspicious activity. By taking these actions, countries can disrupt the underlying criminal business models that enable crime and terrorism. Countries need to recognize the importance of this issue. This is about taking away the economic motives for serious crimes, such as drugs and arms trafficking, environmental crime, and much more. If countries take action, we can make money laundering through trade too risky, too complicated, and in the end, unprofitable. So with this, I would finish uh, my introduction and hand over to Henny verber kustus to say a few words. So the floor is yours, Henny. Thank you very much, Marcus. And um, well, following Marcus' description of this highly sophisticated and effective technique for money laundering, 
Um, I would stress why this is of big importance for the ECMOND group. I'm very happy with the fact that this is a joint project and a joint report. Financial intelligence units are organizations that are solely based on the FATF recommendations. That's where we started from. Having one FIU in each jurisdiction, all having in essence the same core functions being receiving suspicious transaction reports from public sector, from the obliged entities, storing and analyzing these reports and disseminating them to law enforcement. And this is extremely important because what we do as FIUs is connect like that the private sector with the public sector and making financial intelligence available in the fight against money laundering and terrorism financing. And as we probably all know, being in this webinar, is that organized crime and with it money laundering is in essence an international crime. So we cannot do without international information exchange and cooperation. The Ekmont Group currently connects 166 FIUs with that 166 jurisdictions. And our core issue, our core business is to facilitate the information exchange between these FIUs, but not just information exchange, also exchange of knowledge. And if we look at money laundering techniques, we have the, the if I may say so, the real simple ones where you carry along cash with you but we also have the more complicated techniques and trade-based money laundering is considered by us to be one of the more complicated ones. There we felt the need to exchange the expertise and the knowledge of the FIUs, but also the other organizations that have worked together on this project and on this report, because this allows us to share this knowledge with the jurisdictions, with the FIUs in those jurisdictions who haven't acquired that knowledge yet, but still have to play a very important role because that's the main task, this is the strategy of the Egmont Group. We believe in cooperation. We believe in international cooperation and coordination because only then we believe we can add value to the fight against money laundering and terrorism financing. So having said that, I really want to thank everyone who has contributed in this project and in this report for doing so. And I hope it will find its way to all those organizations who will need the knowledge that is gathered here. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, thank you, Henny, for your very interesting remarks. And uh, thank you again for the work of the Egmont Group on this report. Uh, can I ask you, what are your three main takeaways from the report, Henny? Well, you have, you have already in your introductory remarks hinted a bit on it, but uh, what we have seen also in this report, since it is a, a complex issue, um, it, it changes rapidly in the way it is being dealt with. It, it has, there is so much trade around, around the globe. So there's so much opportunities to hide your, your illegal money in um, that we have identified that it is important not only for FIUs to cooperate, but also to find a close cooperation with other public entities. And for instance, if you look at international trade, to, to just give you one simple example, it is customs, the customs organizations who see a lot of the trade it's the financial intelligence units who may see a lot of the financial transactions. If we can combine that information, and that's, that's only two of, of, of more organizations involved, that will, get, that will bring you to a clear picture. And the Egmont Group and the World Customs Organization have already started working together. There's a handbook cooperation customs FIU because it's important. But also public-private cooperation because how can the private sector detect the, the transactions, detect the illegal flows if they are not informed on what to look for, what to be aware of? 
um, to be advised on on how to report what what they see. So public private cooperation here is extremely important. And for FIUs specifically also the invitation to be creative in the approaches of analysis, because our regular way of working is that we work from the transactions we receive but sometimes you can start working on what kind of company structures are there in my countries are there topologies that we can uh, that we can make use of to identify possible companies that might be involved in trade-based money laundering it's it's more or less approaching the issue from another from another angle so it's public public cooperation public-private cooperation, and it is creative analysis. Those are the three ones. Uh, thank you, Henny. You were referencing customs authority. So this is the ideal moment to bring in Kevin Yu, who works for UK Customs and who was one of the co-leads of this TBML paper. Uh, Kevin, from your perspective of law enforcement, what key issues uh, should they be aware of? Thank you, Marcus. Firstly, it's great we're at publication day. Um, a lot of people have worked hard to produce today's report. I'd like to give my own thanks to colleagues from Egmont for co-sponsoring the report, uh, to Tamara, Don and Lizette from the Netherlands for assisting me in co-authoring the report, uh, and finally, of course, the project team members for their insight and engagement. On to your question. Um, I think given the complexity of TBML that Henny has referenced, I think the key theme for me for law enforcement is education. And that has two specific strands. The first is, is to deepen our understanding of trade financing processes. We're really good at, at recognizing predicate offenses pas audio, and into TBML. Ah, si. so activities such as, as drug trafficking et, et or si tax frauds. But really, it's those trade financing processes si that enable money laundering or terrorism financing. Alors, and so by better understanding the differences between open account trading or documentary collections, et, or letters et, of credit, we can better understand et, the areas that criminal groups or terrorist financiers et, et, exploit. Ah, là, branché, là, so with that rentre. insight and knowledge, là, law enforcement can then better ouais, identify là, weaknesses in their TBML or TBTF, trade-based terrorist financing schemes, et, which we can attack and disrupt. I think this is particularly pertinent given the seismic shock the global trade system has felt as a result of COVID. We could well see short-term adaptations in trading behavior as a result. Types of goods traded and how they're traded could change. So the more law enforcement understands the nuances within trade financing, the better equipped we will be to identify changes in methodology. And so my second uh, element of, of education is the need for law enforcement and AML supervisors to assist uh, non-financial bodies enhance their understanding of trade-based money laundering. You know, the report is a powerful example of harnessing the insight and expertise of public and private sector bodies. However, a lot of that knowledge is held by financial institutions. So we need to encourage broader and deeper cooperation with other sectors like accountants, financial advisors, bookkeepers, company formation agents. The FATF standards provide a really great framework that encourages cooperation between critical partners in both the public and private sector. So if we can help those individuals or businesses spot discrepancies in trading patterns, they can feel confident in reporting that activity into their financial intelligence unit. To take one example from the report, if we can help accountants or bookkeepers understand that the presence of a previously unknown third party could be indicative of trade-based money laundering, or that increased unexplained cash integration could be indicative of a criminal group or terrorist financier infiltrating a supply chain, we can then encourage the distribution of more usable and useful actionable intelligence. Quite simply, law enforcement thrives on increased data flows. So the more we can help information holders share that data, the more likely we will drive enhanced operational outcomes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. So from a law enforcement perspective, uh, educating oneself and others is key. I would like now to turn to, uh, to the FIU perspective and, and so to you, um, Sen, um, Mrs. Sten, uh, what practices should FIUs be implementing globally to be more effective in the fight against TBML? 
Thank you, Marcus. Also from my side, I think it's really exciting that we have this report ready for publication today. And also I would like to thank the project group and um, all the colleagues who have worked on this report. Also a big thank you to my colleagues from over 20 FIEs who have um, contributed to the work that the Ekman group was able to contribute here. So to the question of what practices FIEs should adapt, as um, Henny said earlier, one of the core um, functions of FIEs is to do the analysis. And when we talk about analysis on TBML, which as um, you all mentioned, can be very complex um, techniques and very complex mechanisms to do this analysis, FIEs would need information and pieces of information from very different resources. And um, we know from our exchange with the different FIU colleagues that these information from different sources, they can be a lot. And to deal with this high number and also big complexity of different resources and information, one key thing is IT tools. Having IT tools and new technology in place, that is the way forward. That is what we need in FIU's anal analysis work. Um, just to give you a brief example, we had um, cases where FIUs mentioned that for um, their analysis on a TBML case, they had information coming from different financial institutions on, transac on financial transaction payments. They had data coming in from uh, the customs services, which uh, entailed um, trade related data. Um, also, there were criminal records coming from the colleagues from law enforcement entities and um, registration information from other authorities. They also take um, tax information. So all those different pieces of information, you can actually consider them like different pieces of a puzzle that the, the FIU takes and puts together. But when you think of data analysis, all those different pieces in the puzzle, they come in different formats. They come in different quality. Um, they come in different structures and sometimes they're even in an unstructured way. So doing um, analysis manually, it's basically impossible. So we need IT tools and we need good new technology and um, like really powerful tools so that those can help us to streamline the data. Those would help us to normalize the data, to match the data and visualize, for example, um, unusual developments, spikes, or that help us to see where networks are and where there might be, for instance, also clusters, which are unusual and need further attention. So having IT tools in place, this is really key for the analysis of FIUs and for preparing good reports to pass on to law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Chen. So collecting different pieces of information to complete the puzzle and using IT tools uh, for this exercise, um, uh, that, that is key from your perspective. Uh, that very well fits to the FATF presidency priority on the potential of digitization. Um, so thank you, thank you for this insight. Um, Henny, back to you. Uh, what steps do you think uh, FIUs need to take next in relation to TBML? Uh, Marcus, this is Duncan. It looks like Henny has lost connection. Oh, okay, okay. So then we go to um, Kevin. Um, what would you like to see happen, particularly in relation to public-private uh, sector partnerships, Kevin? Thank you, Marcus. I think the report does a really good job of advocating for public-private partnership initiatives. That is where law enforcement and maybe the financial intelligence unit sit down with trusted private sector partners, usually financial institutions, to, to share intelligence and insight around risks. Uh, and because we've said repeatedly that TBML is, is highly complex, that kind of insight and engagement uh, through those PPP initiatives is vital. So I think there are three things I'd like to see really with public-private partnerships. The first is the continued expansion of these initiatives across the globe. I think the report provides several case studies about how these initiatives have driven impact, particularly against a complex threat like trade-based money laundering and trade-based terrorist financing. So I hope it encourages the establishment of new PPP initiatives, which can be built around strategic discussions of significant money laundering risks and or allow public or private partners to share intelli operational intelligence in real time 
that drives new types of interventions. I think what the report does really well is, is offer people different types of models that can work effectively within their legal frameworks, particularly around confidentiality and data sharing. Secondly, and, and being really ambitious here, I think it would be great if we could start to explore uh, more systematically how those existing partnership initiatives can work internationally, so beyond their national boundaries, particularly given that a consistent feature of TDML is its international nature and the exploitation of the trade system. So from a very personal experience, I've already had really productive conversations with colleagues in the US, in the Netherlands, Australia and the Asian Development Bank about how our respective partnership initiatives can work bilaterally or multilaterally. That's going to take some time and it's going to require some real significant leadership to drive that forward. But the fact that, you know, within a couple of weeks of finishing the report, we're having those conversations already, I think that's a really positive development. And so my third aspect of, of PPP initiatives is that existing initiatives expand subject to the right levels of due diligence and appropriate legal gateways to include critical trade stakeholders, such as freight forwarders or customs brokers. I think the report draws out how vital those individuals can be in providing that additional piece of the puzzle that Jen has already mentioned. These guys are at the coalface of a lot of this trade activity. And so they can tell us about what does misdescription look like on the ground? What does that risk of phantom, phantom shipments that you referenced in, in your opening remarks really look like? And what can we do or how can we use them as information providers, as our eyes and ears on the ground to facilitate a better understanding of those specific TBML risks? So I think those are my three key ambitions for public-private partnership initiatives. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. So expanding public-private partnerships, going uh, cross-border, having bilateral connections between these public-private partnerships and include critical trade actors. Um, uh, very good ideas. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin, for this. I don't know whether we have uh, Kenny back. I do, it doesn't look like. Um, so uh, let me thank uh, Henny and Kevin and Chen uh, for your um, remarks. Um, we are now happy to take questions on the TBML paper. Um, let me say that in this paper, um, we make clear at one point that um, the overarching theme of this report is uh, vigilance. And um, here, journalists can also play a role. So with this, um, is there anyone who has a question on this paper? So, Kevin, uh, this very much sounds like a question for you. Kevin, would you like to come in here? Yes, thank you, Marcus, and, and thank you, Kus, for a really good question. So, on the kind of practical dissemination of, of intelligence and insight, um, you know, a number of jurisdictions will have liaison officers based in, in key uh, countries. So, HMRC, the Revenue and Customs Service of the UK, for example, uh, we have our liaison officers overseas. We often use those as our dissemination channel. So they they will uh, they will be encouraged to work with their partners in country to share insight and information around critical risks. You know, so are professional money launderers operating in that jurisdiction? And if so, what are the kind of mechanisms and methods they are using, including trade-based money laundering and, and, and more physical types of cash integration uh, that, that you and Henny have touched on? So that's kind of one obvious way to do that. Obviously, the FATF forum itself uh, and, and the production of these reports is another way that we encourage jurisdictions and competent authorities um, to take the insight from the report and apply that to their national position. So looking at their national risk assessment and saying, you know, are we at risk of, of illicit cash integration? And if so, what does that look like? Is it cash in freight? Is it people approaching a financial institution looking to pay in large sums of money? Is there a particular abuse of company for uh, company structures and, and the misuse of front companies or shell companies? So those are a couple of ways that we encourage uh, that dissemination of intelligence and insight to help inform uh, tackling the risk much more effectively. 
Uh, just to your second point uh, around standardization, perhaps around um, cash activity and cash purchases, you know, so recommendation 32 is the kind of critical uh, FATF recommendation around cash. Uh, and so I think uh, how we consistently apply that, how we disseminate intelligence from cash declarations, I think is a first positive step that we can take. And then much like the point around national risk assessments anyway, I think countries should be encouraged to consider whether or not the application of cash limits is a sensible and practical measure proportionate to the nature of risk that they are exposed in. So if you limit cash transactions to 3000 euros, for example, we need to think about what the displacement activity might be. Will we see a move into maybe virtual assets? Will we see an exploitation of bank accounts in a different way than perhaps we anticipated? So um, while there is merit in considering a kind of cash limit, I think we would need to consider, you know, as a policy forum, as, as the global watchdog, as, as Marcus has described, whether or not such a blanket application is, is sensible uh, and proportionate to the nature of risk in each jurisdiction. So I, I think those are the areas that I would, I would probably focus on in the first instance is building that evidence base to support such an approach. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Um, uh, I wonder, Chen, can, can you um, come in here? Um, I think we have numbers, figures in the report about trade. Um, so how much of this um, is seen by the FIUs? Chen, do you have uh, figures? Mm. That is a very good question, but it's also a very difficult question. With regard to um, actual numbers, I mean, international um, trade, all in all, I think in the report we have the number, it's um, for one year in 2019, I believe, uh, the trade volume internationally had been 19 billion, uh, 19 trillion, I'm sorry. So that's like a, a huge number, I think, with more than, yeah, with 12 zeros at the end. So um, when we talk about how big is um, trade-based money laundering, what um, we learned from also responses from the different um, countries and um, FIUs participating that it's really hard to quantify. Um, that is not only because um, trade-based money laundering is complex and it's um, also um, revolving, but it's also because we're talking about um, international trade here. So it's not um, an issue that can be um, taken statistically in um, single countries uh, by itself. And, um, but we know that the potential of trade-based money laundering really is quite immense because those schemes, as uh, mentioned earlier, they can be very complex and um, at times they can be very simple. So they're very versatile. That means that also for us, it's really important to, as Kevin mentioned earlier, to broaden the understanding about those schemes so that we can see more of those instances receive more information. One thing that um, also relates probably more to the second question is what are the types of groups which are working here? And I think in a lot of the case studies that we saw from the FIEs, but also from the other authorities is that um, professional money launderers have been identified to be involved in a lot of those cases. And um, the thing with professional money launderers is I mean, that is their business. That's what they do. They might not be involved in other predicate offenses, but laundering money, that is what they thrive in. That's how they earn their money. And we see a lot of cases that they use trade-based money laundering, but we also know that they might not focus on that entirely. They just use whatever route there is that they can discover. And when they use trade-based money laundering, they might use any sector, any product, any jurisdiction that you know they can go into. So that is also why it's so difficult to, um, to get hold of um, those schemes and why it's so important that a broad um, range of different um, stakeholders and players in the AML community are aware of those schemes. I hope that answers the question, thank you.
Thank you, Douglas. Uh, Chen, since, since you elaborated on the IT tools, uh, I, I feel the question goes to you again. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, well, IT tools, that really is the issue. I mean, we have a lot of data um, and to actually process that, you know, when you do it the traditional way, taking one receipt and putting it next to the other, it just doesn't work. And we're talking here about um, larger data sets. And um, for example, we're not talking about 10, 20, 100 transactions. At times we have uh, thousands of transactions. So without IT tools, it's definitely um, not gonna work. And uh, I just saw Henny raising a hand. So um, just quickly pass over to you, Henny. Yeah, no, you answered perfectly because this is this is exactly the case. Since since trade based money laundering is uh, dealing with lots and lots of data, we have to process all the organizations involved, lots of data, and we need a technology for that. What I would want to add is that uh, also for the international information exchange, also from the Egmont Group's perspective, we are currently conducting a review of our IT facilities to also identify in what way we can also have better, more sophisticated IT in place to also make it easier for the FIUs to exchange big loads of data and even see in what way they can jointly analyze. Because as, as Jen said, it's, it's about tons of data and it's about um, a technique that, that, that is in several jurisdictions that has to do with international uh, facets and international cooperation. So that, that's, it's not only the FIUs, but also for the cooperation between the FIUs. That's what I would want to add. Thank you. Okay, um, Kevin, would you like to take that question? I'd be delighted. Thank you, Marcus, and, and thank you, Sabina. So, um, as already mentioned um, by one of your colleagues, uh, the key, a key facet of the report was around illicit cash integration. Uh, and given the nature of the predicate offences that we see uh, that precede trade-based money laundering, a lot of those still sort of deal in what we call street cash, you know, that there are those transactions, whether it's uh, drug trafficking or the smuggling of, of excise goods such as cigarettes or alcohol. So we haven't seen the kind of large scale or significant shift into the use of crypto assets. But inevitably, as, as they become more integrated into the trade process, uh, as people start to flex, you know, we've already mentioned the potential trade changes in trading patterns, but also purchasing patterns, people may wish to use virtual currencies more it's likely that we would see a consequential shift. But at the moment, certainly during the reporting period uh, that we cover within the report, we were still seeing that reliance on, on cash generation and subsequently illicit um, cash integration. So, uh, you know, it's something we're going to keep an eye on. One of the key sort of recommendations as a, as a community within FATF is that we intend to revisit this report in sort of 18 to 24 months time, checking the progress we've made seeing to what extent people have endorsed the recommendations that we identified or the suggested actions and to what extent maybe the nature of the risk has changed um, in any way so whether there has been a growth in, in virtual assets and you know colleagues in, in the FATF community have just published a, a, be, I think a best practices paper on on virtual assets usage so there's a clear synergy between that insight from that activity and what we're doing in the in the TBML space. Um, so to your second question, uh, the, the other types of, of trade-based money laundering techniques. Um, so as Marcus has mentioned, there was obviously the risk of phantom shipping. Uh, so that's where no goods move at all. And it's just basically a paper exercise and, and sharing invoices. Uh, this, the misdescription of goods was a, was a really key feature of a number of the case studies uh, referenced by colleagues from across the globe. So these are what we call kind of traditional trade-based money laundering techniques. They were first identified in the FATF paper in 2006 and in the subsequent paper in 2012. However, what was quite novel and what we've seen uh, since that last paper was the integration of, of criminal activity and, and to a lesser extent terrorist financing activity into legitimate supply chains. 
So there was no need to create false invoices. There was no need to misdescribe or misvalue goods. We've seen criminals essentially buy their way in as a kind of silent partner, for want of a better word, into a business and then essentially continue to use that business in a very legitimate way, but to clean their illicit proceeds. So they were conducting transactions in moving foodstuffs into West Africa, for example or well, they were conducting transactions that saw the import export of car products. So for me, I think that's probably the most compelling new technique that we saw in the report was that we, we were seeing criminals and to a lesser extent terrorist financiers essentially buying their way into legitimate supply chains, which adds some real complexity into the mix. Uh, and you know, back to Jen's point, that's where data analysis becomes even more critical when we don't have the luxury of a fake invoice to say, you know, this is an example of TVML. We, we have to kind of think about those risks in a slightly more subtle and nuanced way. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Kevin, would you like to come in again? <laughs> sure. Thank you, John. Uh, funny enough, it's a, it's a conversation I've been having very recently with colleagues in the UK, actually, um, I was speaking to some compliance officers from Barclays and they were asking that, you know, that exact question. Um, all we can do, I think, in the, in the short term is use some of the risk indicators we've identified in the report, which we're currently in the process of, of refining and, and they're due for publication, I think, early next year in January. But things like where you see a third party involved in the financial settlement, we think that is indicative of, of trade based money laundering potentially. So. I think it's going to be using those risk indicators in the absence of more kind of nuanced discussions around uh, the specific trade financing activities and, and whether there's things that we can do with the financial institutions to, to reduce those weaknesses. I think those are the areas we intend to, or certainly from the UK perspective, we intend to focus on in the first instance in our public private partnership initiative, um, as well as, you know, the things that the banks see themselves. So they've seen you know, the, the misuse of certain types of company formations. And as Henny has suggested, that can be another way into the problem. So it's not always about the financial transaction. It's about whether there's been a particular growth, an, you know, an un, a surprising growth in, in certain types of company formation that then as they do their due diligence through the supply chain, they have suspicions of or have directly identified trade-based money laundering. They share that with us as law enforcement, enforcement and customs and we do that analysis from our end and, and kind of produce that collaborative uh, impact that we hope to achieve. So a little bit of using the risk indicators, but also a little bit of using the, um, the risking processes within in, in the institutions themselves. And I think Jen wants to, to come in from a, a financial intelligence unit perspective. Yes, maybe just to add a little bit, we know that from the experience of different FIEs that even today already, um, financial institutions report instances of possible um, TBML um, not only from their trade finance departments, but we also get reports where financial institutions just report, for example, um, from open account settlement or even from correspondent banking transactions when they see irregularities um, in terms of, you know, the behavior of the customer, the transaction um, amounts, um, general activity on the account, or when they see that um, large amounts of um, money are coming from um, offshore jurisdiction through one of their correspondent banking um, partners. And um, that is something that we already received today. And as Kevin said, when we um, going forward, um, share more information and more um, risk indicators with um, the financial um, institutions and with other private sector partners, we hope of course to receive even more um, reports and also possibly even higher quality reports on TBML. Okay, I don't see any more raised hands from the journalist market, so that may very well be a wrap. Okay, so thank you so much. A big thank you to all who attended. Um, uh, I should make you aware of uh, the paper that is now online. And if you have any further questions after this press conference, please go to the FATF media team. Uh, I'm sure they will be able to help you. I don't want to conclude the session uh, without uh, thanking um, uh, all who have worked on this paper. I think we have an excellent uh, paper 
I want to thank the panelists today, uh, Kenny, Jen, Kevin, uh, for joining me in this press conference. And uh, I wish you all a wonderful season's break and please stay healthy. And with this, I conclude the press conference. Thank you. <laughs>